Today is our conversation with Michael Biggs. And Stella, I'm really excited to introduce this conversation to our listeners. Yeah, Michael Biggs is a, is a linchpin if anybody wants to, do, to kind of delve into the story of the medicalization of children's gender identity. His work has been really, really pivotal in our finding out how, what is the impact of puberty blockers on children? And, you know, he, he's an academic. He's, you know, he did his PhD. He's from New Zealand, but did his PhD in Harvard. And he's now an associate professor of sociology in Oxford. So mm -hmm. like I said, he's, he's earlier, he's no slouch. No, he definitely uh, is, is very well respected in the academic world. And w where this really started for um, Dr. Biggs, as he tells us in this interview, is he was a sociology professor. And of course, they talk about many different topics in his courses. And he noticed that when they were talking about things around gender and gender transition, his students had very rigid kind of ideas of how you're allowed to talk about it. And he just thought this was interesting. And yeah. Yeah, he started kind of saying, you know, I don't know much about this puberty blockers thing. Let me learn more about it. He was in, of course, at Oxford at the time in the UK. And so he started to look into the Tavistock. And previous to that, he had been a, a very staunch ally, a very LGBTQ, you know, um, pro kind of very, very, very into it when he was when he was in Harvard years previously. And he found it very strange when he started looking into it in an academic way that information was being buried and it's like mm -hmm. he turned into a detective and he sent all these freedom of information requests, which had he not sent them, we wouldn't be talking about the Dutch because we wouldn't know what was wrong. It was only that he had the, frankly, the, the genius stroke of I'm going to send in freedom of information it requests into the Tavistock, which is the largest gender clinic in the world. And I'm going to find out different information around things like suicide and puberty blockers and the, you know, can you replicate a trial, you know, that's ongoing and what are the results of this? And he kept on going with that. And it was an, an extraordinarily helpful and valuable contribution to our knowledge about puberty blockers. Right. And, you know, even though there's some kind of clinical language in here, we just thought this was so important because if if anybody is starting to kind of get interested in this concept of gender and particularly like children who are now transitioning on a pretty large scale, this all started with these types of investigations. Michael Biggs played a really big role in the unfolding process at the Tavistock, which is in again in the UK. And his investigations contributed to the CAS review, which was a long two-year review, which ultimately ended up shutting down the Tavistock because they found these treatment interventions were actually not safe and not to be practiced in that way. And so what Michael then did is he said, okay, well, this whole thing has happened in the UK. Everything is kind of crumbled. Like the, these interventions that they were performing on children turned out not to be safe. I wonder about where it all started, which is in the Netherlands. So the Dutch were really the first people in the early 2000s to take these puberty blocking drugs and use them off label in order to better facilitate gender transition. They had never been used in this manner before. And so when Michael turned his um, you know, incredibly discerning research eye towards the Dutch, he continued to unravel this, you know, a story which is often told that the Dutch have this incredibly rigorous, well thought out procedure and that it's safe and they're doing it the right way. And what Dr. Biggs found in his investigation, again, kind of shocked him and was a really important part of us now trying to understand these these treatments. And what people need to know as well is that like Peggy Cohn Kettenus, she she was a clinician in the 1990s in 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 the Netherlands and made a decision that was about to change the world of so many children in future generations. She made a de decision to repurpose puberty blockers, which were designed for very young children with precocious puberty. And she was going to try it on a client of hers who, who was going through puberty and hated her periods. It same, seemed like some sort of phobia around her periods. And from that, an idea was born. Yeah. And uh, it, it, from that, it, you know, it snowballed into the puberty blockers, which ended up being the Dutch protocol. And Michael Biggs was was like he was like, a, 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 like I say, a detective. He had this laser like focus of what we need to know to figure out 
the full picture because frankly it turns out as we will explore in future episodes it turns out that information was being buried yes and let's find out how hi i'm stella o'malley a psychotherapist in ireland and i'm sasha ayad an adolescent therapist in the united states through in-depth interviews personal stories and psychological exploration we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Hi, we are here, Stella, with Michael Biggs. Dr. Biggs, thank you so much for joining us. That's my pleasure. Nice to to see you both. So we we think this conversation is so important. As far as I can tell, you have done the most detailed, intricate analysis of the entire Dutch protocol and the history of many of the kind of concepts and ideas that fed into this justifying of, you know, intervening with children's puberty and hormones. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your background, because my understanding is you were a sociologist and you were teaching kind of almost like a, not a debate class, but some sort of dialogue about various medical ethical questions. And you you realized something was strange about the way your students were responding. Am I getting that right? Just kind of like from the beginning? Uh, yes, that's roughly correct. It wasn't a medical ethics. It was just a straight sociology course um, okay. for master's students. And so we read a lot of sociology theory, a lot of empirical analysis. And then in the final week, uh, we give them a puzzle, some puzzles, and they choose between various puzzles. Like, here's a phenomena. You're a sociologist now. Stop reading what sociologists have written. Instead, you get come up with some ideas, some hypotheses, and some ways of testing them. So it's just a kind of nice little way of ending the term. And for some reason, I must have seen in The Guardian increasing number of trans kids. So I just thought, oh, you know, put that in. I had no particular thoughts on it. It was just an exercise. And then we had, I thought, a good discussion. And interestingly enough, in the discussion, someone was saying, oh, my my boyfriend teaches in a school and quite a few girls who are in the same friendship group. They identify as trans. And, you know, we discussed that a little bit, but, you know, I didn't, it was just, I was just facilitating a discussion. I had no particular investment in that. And then after the class, a, a student who was naturally American uh, said to me, you know, things were said, which we should not, you know, you should have controlled, you know, you should have stopped things being bad things being said in that class, which of course, well, of course I was, you know, uh, you know, upset that, that a student was, was unha- unhappy, but I also realized that's something you, you should, if you objected to something, you should say it in the seminar, you know, have a, have, bring some criticism or, you know, um, um, in the seminar, you don't go to the, per- the person afterwards and say you should preemptively sort of stop things being said. And yeah. so, and I got a really. Can, can, can I say, Michael, you were, you did your PhD in Harvard and you were like very pro LGBT in the 90s. Yes, the absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. I was very, I was actually quite knowledgeable about the trans stuff from the 1990s. Um, I'd been to see Leslie Feinberg, I'd been seeing Kate Bornstein lectures. I, you know, was very um, sort of kept abreast much more than most people with the trans stuff. I even went to the first FTM female to male. Uh, trans conference and it was held in Boston, you know, for example. Oh. You know, so I was quite, you know, sort of an ally, as we would say <laughs> in today's mm-hmm. uh, jargon, I was an ally back in the 1990s. So I was also like, well, hold on a second. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an ally. What are you, yeah. what are you um, objecting to? But I, I right. think the thing is, it's not a really bad vibe. I mean, I knew there was something odd because at that point I'd been teaching for maybe two de- 20, over 20 years and as a graduate school. And so I, was, I taught, there was something different about this. This mm. wasn't just a Thing. And, and when when students, was that? Just to give us a timeline, what year was this? Class this was twenty sixteen, I think twenty sixteen, okay. possibly twenty seventeen. Yeah. Okay, keep going. And then two German students emailed me and said that was also very problematic. So it wasn't just this one student who happened to be peculiar. Clearly, there was something going mm. on here. And then I started reading about it. Reading read a read a, an excellent blog um, by by a woman called Gallus Mag. Um, called Gender Trender. I don't know if, yeah, some some people might have read that. It was uh, back in the back yeah. in the day. And so yes. I became a bit more uh, skeptical of some of the things I'd or- earlier believed, and then I was particularly concerned about from from a point of view of academic freedom. We really need to we really need to sort of be able to discuss things, and and that was where I came at it. That was the direction I came at it. 
And then uh, when I started, he, I mean, saw on Twitter these maybe feminists saying, "Oh, they're giving kids the you know the same drug they give to you know sex chemically castrate sex offenders." And I thought that's obviously nonsense. They like, obviously they're not going to do that. And then I looked into a bit more, and this drug, Lupron, which is used in America, well, was the same drug. And I thought it must be the same, must be a very different dose. But they must be giving a one, one, one hundredth of the dose to these kids that they give to the sex offenders. And then I realized it's the same dose. And then I became a bit more concerned about this. And I started reading the, the this, you know, because I'm a social scientist, so I start reading the literature. I When I read the first paper from the Dutch clinicians about the first guinea pig, the girl that is now called um, so FG or was called B in the paper. I thought this doesn't seem like a good outcome at all. Why that? Why is this meant to be a good outcome? Because when she was followed up, could you um, explain why it's not a good outcome? Just yeah, because when she was followed up at the age of um, uh, in her thirties or early thirties or his thirty early thirties, whichever which way you want to say, um, they were they were ashamed of the genitals and couldn't hold down a relationship with a woman um, because they're so sort of ashamed of the genitals. So it was very odd to say, well, that, that we've cured the genitals dysphoria, but this person's very ashamed of the genitals and can't have a And this was the only long-term study we really had. Of yeah, and that was the, that was the, and supposedly that was the, oh, what, how wonderful. This was a study that came out in 2014, the follow-up uh, study. So I thought that's, that doesn't sound good at all. And then when I looked at the the, um, the 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 article that really lays out the sort of the, the positive empirical evidence again, 2014, uh, they they had they started off with 70 kids and then one of them dies. Uh, so I thought, you know, that's that doesn't seem such a great a great thing if you kill you take take 70 healthy Dutch teenagers, you know, probably have the longest life expectancy of any country in the world, and then you kill one of them. That again. I, so I wasn't seeing from my scrutiny of the literature a, a very positive, uh, you know, it was a very mixed record at, at, at best. But in, so many ways, in many ways, like w w when one child dies, you know, if that was a if that was a study for COVID vaccines, that would be the end of that COVID mm -hmm. vaccine. It, it, it's a kind of open and shut. One has died. It hasn't worked. Arguably, exactly. let's let's pack up and go home. Exactly. And of course, but and of course, the great irony is that because all these the positive results are based on the sort of, you know, sort of giving the kids questionnaires, the kid who died didn't complete the questionnaire, obviously was dead. So he couldn't didn't even enter into the results. So I just thought that was this was this the evidence is very weak. And from then, I thought uh, I sort of somehow found out perhaps from uh, Stephanie uh, Davis Arai from Transgender Trend, that the Tavistock had also um, begun a study on to puberty blockers. So I thought, well, let's let's see what, what evidence they came up with. And so I emailed them because they had a press release on their website. Oh, we started in 2011, the study of puberty blockers. Isn't this wonderful? And so I emailed them saying, oh, what were the results? Because they said, here's the email. If you want to know more, here's email us. And I had the email. I emailed them. Oh, I'd be very interested to know what, what results there were. No response, of course. And then I started to get very suspicious then because at this point it's like maybe 2018, I think, and that's seven years after the study began, like what, what's happened? And also as, a, as, a, as an academic, I know that when you get good results, you publish them. You only don't publish the results if they're bad. And so that already kind of raised a red flag for me. The fact that they weren't publishing the results meant that the results weren't good. So what did you do? So then I just sent off some freedom of information requests, particularly for to get the, the original kind of study protocol. Can I just ask you there, because this to me was a, a, a very clever move on your part. And it was a key move that you decided, well, I'll find it out through freedom of information. Had you ever done that before? Was this? Were, were no, you... no, I never, never had done that before. Because you're like the, the detective of academia, of puberty blockers here. Yeah, I just, I just, yeah, I just thought, I, I don't know even how I came up with the idea, but I thought I'm going to, you know, I, just, I want to find the results. And then I also just from the annual report, um, the annual report the, to the governors, I found some preliminary results, which were bad. And they just, they just put them in there. Um, nobody had noticed them. The governors obviously hadn't noticed them. The board of governors of the Tavistock Trust. I mean, should say the Tavistock is sort of shorthand for the Gender Identity Development Service, which is the, the pediatric clinic for England and Wales um, and Northern Ireland and also Ireland as well, some some kids from Ireland. So it's kind of the, the main British, it's the biggest gender clinic, a pediatric gender clinic mm -hmm. in the world. 
and so it serves you know, Britain in, in the broader sense, excluding Scotland. And so that it's, it's run in the Tavistock Trust. And so there was a, a, a report of the preliminary results of the first 30 children who had got puberty blockers in Britain. And again, that the results were negative. I found conference papers from the head of the clinic, Polly Carmichael, and an endocrinologist, Gary Butler. They were saying, we're not finding the good results the Dutch found. But those papers were never, were never, I and never what, saw the papers. When you say papers, good results, yeah. what were the bad results or what were the results? Just so, so people know. So the, the the claims that De Vries et al. 2014, and that's the kind of la that's the that's the entire basis of puberty suppression. These are the Dutch clinicians. These the are Dutch the researchers that everyone Dutch refers to. The mm -hmm. gold that's, standard. That, mm -hmm. the, yeah, that's the, the the absolute little linchpin of of of, of pediatric gender transition, really. And that is, um, they, they said it, it reduces gender dysphoria and it reduces psychological distress. So those were the two sort of good results. And the, the, the Tavistock, they used the same puberty blockers, they had 44 kids. And of the first, when they looked at the first 30, they found that actually some of the girls got worse off and the boys didn't get better off. And so they reported this to the conferences uh, but they never published them because, of course, why would you publish data which doesn't doesn't give good results? And then the, the the sort of the thing that I think is the worst scandal is that Polly Carmichael, the head of the 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 the, the, the this pediatric clinic, had already said to a newspaper years before, "Oh, the results are great, so we're going to go ahead with making rolling up puberty blockers to everybody." So because they started out by saying, "This is just an this is just an experiment. This is just a study." We're going to do this as part of a kind of a research study. And then before they'd even got the data, they said, oh, this, the results are so wonderful. We're now going to make it national policy. I thought that would be very unusual that if you got bad results, that you'd kind of bury them and continue with the treatment. But I don't work in a hospital. Is that unusual? Um, I, th I think burying bad results is normal. I mean, I think that's probably normal. Probably continue with the treatment is probably what, what doesn't doesn't happen. Um, but we know that, you know, lots, of, I mean, bad results, I mean, results that are not just bad, but also insignificant. So let's say somebody, this is we're very common in, in scientific literature and medical literature, and we know this, that if, you know, someone will do get some good positive results from a drug, if somebody finds no effect from the drug, they don't publish it. Okay. Because it's like nobody wants to publish no effect. And so as a result, the literature is always systematically biased in favor of positive effects. And that's particularly the case when the effects are non, you know, from not a proper clinical trial with randomized, you know, randomized control groups, and also when it's a small sample. So there's been a systematic study of, of results that are reported like that, and they often, they, they, they usually don't replicate. So okay. the, what happened with the Dutch results failing to replicate in Britain is very, very common in, in all kinds of scientific research, because somebody gets, a, you know, a, just has a fluke, maybe they have a fluke, or maybe they're very, very enthusiastic, so they may be unconsciously sort of push the results towards the good, towards good. And then when somebody else tries to replicate it, they, they can't find uh, the same sort of results. And so when you got the freedom of information and you thought, oh my God, these are bad results. Did you go to the media then? Or did you go, did you go anywhere before then? Yes, yeah, so I wrote this up for the, a blog, a Transgender Trend, um, that is run by Stephanie Davis Arai, who's one of the sort of pioneers of sort of calling Absolutely. attention to this, um, to the sort of all the, 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 ter the the bad, the downsides of, of, of tra transitioning ch uh, children. And uh, then it was picked up by, I mean, I think uh, the first media article was in the Daily Telegraph, uh, it was like, you know, Oxford professor calls for full results to be released. And um, then there was, on, it was new, featured in new, uh, BBC Newsnight. And so, yeah, so the various sort of, um, and I think what was, uh, Important was that the the data were only released because of because of my efforts. So and they and they really dragged their 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 heels because I made complaints to the the ethics review board that had first approved the research, and they sort of dragged their feet. And then COVID, and so finally they published the results only after the Kira Bell case. So obviously my work was 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 important in the and I was an expert witness in the Kira Bell case that really shed more light on the, the process and to what was going on in the Tavistock. And then they finally, uh, um, uh, Polly Carmichael and, and Gary Butler and their clinicians, they finally published the results after the judicial review verdict, the day after the judicial review verdict. That. So they clearly didn't want the results mm -hmm. to be taken into account of by the judges who were kind of assessing that Kira Bell's claim. 
And you moved on a little bit with the freedom of information before we go to the Dutch, and I'm dying to go to the Dutch. You moved on and you did some freedom of information around the suicide stats, which had been very badly represented or misrepresented. Yes. I mean, in this case, I think the Tavistock wasn't to blame because they'd always said that the risk of suicide is low. But of course, one of the central concepts, in some sense, the just as the sort of Puberty blockers are sort of the, the, the linchpin of pediatric tra- of, of childhood transitioning, but also a, a real cru- crucial sort of preliminary step is to say that kids will kill themselves if they don't get the, if they don't if they if they can't transition. It's better to have a dead it's better to have a live daughter than a dead son, and that rhetoric has been around since the nineteen nineties, and so it's very important to know like what is you know what is the actual data on suicide. Now the Tavistock, I had hadn't. This was activists who were making these claims about suicide. Activists in Mermaids, which is the charity for transgendering children, um, which has been um, sort of now under investigation from the Charity Commission. But they they propagated this very misleading statistics. Now it's true that if you ask in a survey, if you ask trans kids, have, you know, do you consider, you know, do you think about suicide or have you even attempted suicide, you will get very large. Uh, numbers and I think that's obviously a, that's 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 a real concern. That's a genuine concern. We can't dismiss that. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the kids are actually at risk of killing themselves because we know that people tend to exaggerate. Um, in surveys, we know more general, just in the general population, people tend to exaggerate uh, the the extent to which they they really have really attempted suicide. But moreover, there's a, obviously a concern that when you make suicidality a central part of the ident- identity. That actually that sort of enhances the likelihood of sort of making claims about suicide because to be trans in some ways means to be suicidal because society is rejecting you or your parents are rejecting you. So it's very, very important to actually know how many deaths result. You know, not that obviously suicidal ideation or self-harm are obviously important things also, but we mm-hmm. do need to have a sensible um, a, a real, real knowledge about what the actual fatality rate is, and so I use Freedom of Information Act uh, requests on the Freedom of Information Act to get the data on suicides, um, and it showed that the suicide, I mean, there were four suicides um, over many years uh, out of fifteen thousand patients, and of course that's four terrible tragedies. Um, that's you know that, that, that those are really right. terrible. Terrible mm-hmm. things, and the suicide rate is higher for trans kids, as far as I can calculate. I mean, it's for, estimation is difficult, but it's about perhaps five or six times higher. So that is, of course, uh, you know, a real concern, and shows that this is a very vo- this is a more vulnerable group than the the you know adolescents who aren't trans identify don't identify as trans. However, it's also true that the rate of suicide is actually you know fortunately, I mean, that's good news that it's it's much lower than than might than we might fear. And, and, so it's full. and so I tried to publish this as an academic article, and I was rejected by the you know, British British Medical Journal, The Lancet, or Archives of Suicide, uh, Archives of Suicide Research Plus One. They all sort of rejected the journal article, which of course happens as, as an academic. But I thought it was interesting that it was very hard to get that information published. It was finally published in Archives of Sexual Behaviour, uh, but it's very diff- it's interesting how difficult it was to get the good news. You know what should be really actually good positive news published uh, journals didn't want to it was sort of unpopular to say that uh, the suicide rate was much lower than, than we could have feared. Can, can I ask kind of a, a different question I mean this all started when you realized there was something unusual about the way students were discussing this issue then you started to dig into the research and realize that you know it, you know information is being misreported or not being reported accurately and there's maybe uh kind of some jumping to conclusions and then you went full in i mean your your analysis of this is so comprehensive i'm just curious about that some people might have started to look at this and and think that's a mess i mean i feel really worried about it but i'm not interested in getting involved did you have a personal um driver that allowed you to just i can imagine how this is probably taken over your life in many ways. I mean, you're writing papers, they're not getting published, and you're really digging into the research. Why, I guess? I'm curious about your your motivations. I often often ask myself the same thing. Um, I mean, no, I have no personal investment. Uh, I don't know, you know, I I don't have a kid who identifies as trans. I don't have kids at all. Um, I'm not gay, um, you know, so I'm sort of, I have no, I'm not a feminist. So I have sort of all the normal reasons that bring people into this, this thing. I just, I mean, I suppose I really care about the truth. 
I was just about to say that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, in some sense, like the reason why, I mean, I've, I've been paid, you know, my whole life, I've been paid by universities, by the taxpayer and, or by private universities like at Harvard to, to, to pursue the truth. Right. And mm -hmm. in some sense, I've, I had a nice life. I went to Harvard. I, I'm now at Oxford. I have a privilege. <laughs> I have privilege. And I think, well, truth is important. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm ultimately doing. I'm, I'm ultimately, that's my, you know, that's my the rationale for why the British taxpayer pays my salary. So if I'm not willing to pursue the truth, then then I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Uh, and it's, it's almost tragic back. that that you're a hero in academia, in our eyes anyway, because it, it reflects so badly on academia that that is such a shocking, you know, principle to have that that we're thinking, oh wow, isn't this great? Yeah, I I have been. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say I'm a I'm a, I'm a hero <laughs> because I'm not. You know. Um, you know, Wearing not, a cape. That's just, why you're not a cape. No, I just mean like the, I mean, the, so the, I mean, the, so I also have, you know, I have tenure. So in some sense, I wouldn't do this if I was a postdoc. I wouldn't do it if I was a doctoral mm. student or, a, you know, junior faculty. So I think obviously having some tenure and also Oxford, the University of Oxford is one of the better universities in the English speaking world for academic freedom. So I think, you know, I'm also in a sort of privileged position. So I have to need, use my privilege now for. Yeah. For, for good, with, but with, also I would say that yeah, it is shocking to see just how many people are just cowards because there are so many academics in this, with the same position as me or better positions than me who just refuse to get involved. They'll tell me, "Oh, I really admire, really admire your courage," but I'm not going to do it. You know, I just I just don't lecture. I no longer lecture about mm. this. Or mm -hmm. say, I can't speak out because then I won't be invited to give keynote addresses at female, feminist conferences if I speak out. And you just think, well, that's really you know that's not that's not actually a sacrifice. So they're not saying. I won't. Yeah. I'll be fired, or I'll, you know, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be beaten up. I mean, it's just like I will lose some friends, or I'll lose some professional opportunities. Well, you know, that's not really, that's not. I don't. So that's why I don't think, you know, it's not heroic. It's just what you should expect uh, from somebody who's paid by the taxpayer to be an academic. I think a key thing that stops people from speaking out is they'll lose popularity, they'll lose esteem, they'll lose a lot of kind of um, respect among their peers. There's been an awful lot of self-censorship that isn't necessarily going to impact their careers. It's going to impact their, their social status mm. in many ways. Yes. I want yes. to get back to that key point you were making about the suicide. And like you say, every suicide is a tragedy. Four out of 15,000 over a period of 10 years in, in JIDs at the Tavistock. And from for, if memory serves me right, two of those were, were receiving treatment and two were on the waiting list as far as we know. So you couldn't even say it's because they were getting treatment that they, that the numbers, it's, it's, no. it's actually just, can I ask you, what is the comparison of that? Cause you said for a normal, healthy um, uh, adolescent, it's a bit higher. You said five to six times. And I know these figures are rough because it's very difficult when we've got such small numbers, but um, compared to somebody with other men, an adolescent with other mental health issues, is there a comparison at all? No, that's and that's an excellent point. So yes, I, there is no, unfortunately, there's no, there's no good data that we can that we can compare. Um, but certainly, it's the case that's not necessary because they're trans. It's not necessary. The suicidality is a is a direct result of them having a transgender identity. It may well be because they've they've, they've they have other coexisting uh, technical word is comorbidities, which is kind of a mm -hmm. Ugly, ugly word, but other associated conditions. So we we know for sure that, for example, autism, and you know, as a, you you know this, but and this is quite well known, but autism is associated with 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 a transgender identity, and autism, particularly in girls, is associated with a higher rate of suicidality. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, it could just it may the the high, elevated risk of suicide for these this, the kids at the pediatric uh, gender clinic could simply due to the fact that it has a higher than normal. Uh, right, um, proportion of autistic kids. So we've got no reason to think that it could be it's anything to do with the trans identity. It might be, or it might not be. It might well be that kids are prone a little bit more towards, um, let's say, autistic or have sort of problems of being bullied or other kinds of, so it's not just sort of... And you could even uh, you could even go further. And if you look at, let's say, Lisa Lippmann's cohort, and you could say a lot of... of um, teenagers who have adolescent onset gender dysphoria these days have have had traumatic mm -hmm. events happen to them so that they could be a, a, a more distressed group. And so yes, exactly. yes, yes. as a result, you, you would kind of put a laser like focus on the Tavistock and arguably 
this brought about the cast review and arguably now the jids has been completely reconfigured and and uh is set to close as as we know it this year uh, yes, well, there were also there was. I mean, there was. I, I contributed one certain certain important strand of of sort of criticism. I mean, there were also there were inside clinical vo voices of clinicians inside who also were talking about the sort of process and how the process um, was poor and how kids that should not have been um, given uh, medical treatment in their view were were being put through. And, and there were a lot of these clinicians, and I can't really say their names because they haven't given me permission uh, to do so. But there were quite a lot of uh, gay and lesbian clinicians who were very worried about. You know that there are a lot of these kids were just normal gays and lesbians who didn't who were ashamed to be homosexual or had a homophobic environment and were just being kind of put through the the into the trans route so mm -hmm. there was there was also the kind of clinicians sort of whistleblowing clinicians uh who were also calling attention so i think there were yeah various strands yeah. Or i wouldn't say that mine was the most important but i certainly think one this is just um, realizing that they they had basically covered up um, bad results and had gone ahead with a treatment despite the bad, knowing that the results were at least, if not bad, but not positive, uh, is 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 part of, of, of an important part of the story of, of why the CAS review was launched and why um, the, the Tavistock is being, that, that gender clinic will, will close. Yeah, we interviewed David Bell and he explained how, you know, he, he was a whistleblower and a very important one. In uh, and Marcus of, Evans and Sue yeah, Evans as well. Evans, yeah. yeah. And of course, and that's the other thing we should point out is that Sue Evans, I mean, there had been problems with the Tavistock that Sue had tried to flag yeah. and there was an internal review that they buried back in, what's it, 2008, 2009. So this has been, even that was before puberty blockers even. So this is, there's, it's, always, it's always been, you know, transgender medicine has always been a kind of, you know, sort of a scandal waiting to happen. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for the show. To take an even deeper dive and support the show, join our listener community for access to exclusive content, practical tools, and resources supporting gender and identity exploration. We're so grateful to our sponsor, Genspect, an international organization which offers an alternative to WPATH, providing a range of education, resources, and supports to anyone impacted by gender distress Genspect unites many different organizations globally and gives voice to thousands of previously untold stories. For more info, visit genspect.org. And thank you to our sponsor, Rhyme. Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics is a non-profit organization dedicated to improving long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And now back to the conversation. I, I want to ask about the kind of motivations because like the way the way you lay out the story, it's incredibly compelling to think that there are nefarious uh, kind of motivations behind these clinicians, like burying negative data, things like that. But, you know, we we interviewed Steensma and DeVries, and I think they honestly, in their minds, feel they're doing something beneficial for these young people. And I think like you've done a really good job of highlighting in your work that aesthetic outcomes was a main driver for this entire enterprise of early intervention and trying to stop the puberty before it happens and giving the cross-sex hormones. And you talked in your, in your uh, paper about how the clinicians were really impressed and almost like, you know, Stella, you talk about this, like almost intimidated by the power of these like very masculine little girls that would come to see them or so can can mm. you just talk with with us about the importance that aesthetic outcomes played in in what seems to be the decision making for a lot of these interventions and and clinical practices yes absolutely because the rationale i mean that the rationale of early puberty suppression is that you end up with people who look much more like the opposite sex and that's obviously uh, an outcome that is true. Right? It's true that if you start um, early puberty suppression, you'll end up with a, a girl who looks, who has you know quite a lot of masculine features and can pass when she's had a double mastectomy um, and obviously got taken testosterone, you know, looks like a, you know, yeah, yeah, particularly when they're, when you're young, uh, let's say in your early twenties, you look like a really handsome, you know, really handsome young guy, uh, maybe, you know, short, but, um, but, you know, uh, really handsome, you you pass, and then nobody would ever think, oh, this was a this was a, a woman or was, you mm -hmm. know, female. 
and and they yeah and so they're very much interested in in do you pass can you pass which is obviously you know one factor but it's by no means the the only I mean so I I, I think reading the the Dutch literature they really are obsessed with particularly with height for example they're really really concerned about height problem with trans girl you know trans girls are too tall trans boys are not tall enough so they're really interested in height but they're not interested at all about sort of uh, uh libido orgasm those sort of other physical the way you know bodies aren't just good to look at they're also they also do things right sexual <laughs> things or reproduction giving birth or you know having becoming a parent and they're not inter- they weren't interested at all about this it's about how you look you know piggy cohen kittenness who is really the central protagonist in the story who is the the Dutch uh, starts the Dutch um, the first gender clinic uh, for for kids in in Europe in in the n- late 1980s and she pioneers she really drives the puberty blockers um, and she said you know when she saw the first girl who had gone on puberty blockers you know she, she looked really looked so much like a young young boy you know uh, you know young teenage teenage boy and that was just struck blown you know struck by just how good they pass and so it's mm-hmm. really the benefits of of passing. Which is the the cosmetic benefits, which are the ones that that really the the motivate the both uh, obviously the the patients and the clinicians. And just to ca- take up on the point on the sort of motivations, I certainly don't think that there were you know evil motivations. Mm-hmm. I think they were just giving the patients what they wanted, right? Um, and that's the, the the line of least resistance, right? The kids comes in and says, "I want to transition," so you say, "Okay, here's the here are the drugs." You could argue they were guilty for for of being shallow thinkers um mm. certainly you're right that it, the, the dutch focus totally on on the, the aesthetic this is going to produce you know a more male more female person but it's been rewritten in many people as oh the the pain the terrible pain there's no pain like the wrong puberty or something so mm. it, it got lost in translation in the in the way so you turned your your laser like focus from the Tavistock, having having done your work there, and you moved to the Dutch, and you've done quite a bit of work. Could you tell us mm-hmm. what you have uncovered in in what is considered? Anybody who listens to us knows it's considered the gold standards. It's where it all began, and so when you realise it's not replicated in London, let me have a look at what's going on in in the Netherlands. I presume that was your train of thought. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, so and I should say this this is um work that I was published in the Journal of Um Sex and Marital Therapy and it's open access so anybody can 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 read that. The de- so I suppose the history is interesting because the history shows that um they were aware originally. So well the, the first thing I think is important is to say this is a, a treatment for for juvenile transsexuals. That was absolutely for kids who are they'd identified as transsexual. So it was and that's why my, t- my paper, my the title of my paper is Juvenile Transsexuals, because yeah. that is what we're doing, right? You're not sort of, it's not a um, pause for reflection or any any of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. This is a treatment that only makes sense if you say this person is going to be a transsexual. We want the cosmetic outcomes to be as good as possible. Therefore, wow. we need to start early. So mm-hmm. that's the... That that's that honest. That's the sort of much more honest. So the, the earlier articles were actually much more honest in their, their use of language. Um, so I suppose the the other thing that is interesting about the the history is the way that they would admit in the early in the late nineteen nineties they sort of admitted that most gender dysphoria most kids are going to uh, become homosexual and that was based on very good data from males um, but there's no reason there's good reason to, th- to, to think that it, the same applies to females as well. So basically, kids with gender dysphoria turn out to be gay men, and uh, and then for some reason they say, and I, I still there's no sort of logical I think explanation for this, but the idea was that that's true before twelve. So if you see a kid with gender dysphoria before twelve, you say you're most likely to be homosexual. But it, as soon as they've hit their twelfth birthday, you say now they're a transsexual. Let's get the puberty blockers in them and let's you know get them transitioned. Um, now it doesn't make sense to say, you know, 80% of kids are going to be, you know, before 12 and then, so, you know, day before the 12th <laughs> birthday, 80% chance of becoming homosexual. Now, you know, day after their 12th birthday. Um, but, but, but so that, that, that sort of huge it, it, glaring it hole and lot gap mm-hmm. in logic and that disappears mm-hmm. after 2000, they stop talking about homosexuality. It's almost like they've forgotten those results. Is, is that more a function of an attempt to, intercept most kids before puberty really gets going i mean do you think that in in hindsight that's why they justify this bizarre 12 year old kind of marker 
Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, yeah, well, I, I really, I mean, I, there's no logical reason because it's not really logical. And the 12 seems as just purely a juridical as like, because at the age of 12, they can think that the kids can give can sort of more consent. And even then, and I think that's another thing that I've uncovered was when you read um, the, the literature more and more detail, the, mm -hmm. the sort of the fine print, you realize that actually they, they for example, they started kids before 12. So most cases, it was almost cases it was 12, but 12 was not a, a head, hard deadline. And they also yeah. started monitoring children at the age of 10 to sort of mm -hmm. check to see when the, when the puberty was going to hit. So they're already, if you like, once you're monitoring a child, so you've, if this is a, a very famous uh, Dutch uh, tr uh, trans woman, I think now identifies as non-binary, called Valentine. Um, sorry, my ghastly Dutch pronouncers. Mm -hmm. And Valentine was diagnosed at, at the age of five mm. uh, by Peggy Cohen Kittenis, who was the, the, the sort of the, the chief architect of puberty blockers. So, so Valentine has already got the diagnosis. You have gender dysphoria, and Valentine now says that diagnosis made a big, you know, actually that shifted my identity. And then from the age of ten, Valentine was being monitored to let's see if you, you know, test there's too much testosterone in you if you're starting puberty, and then at twelve, puberty blockers. So, you know, in, in fact, the medical process had begun, you know, so it's not just the, you know, the period blockers didn't come till 12, but of course, uh, the medical process had become, begun much, he, this, this kid was put on the medical pathway long before that. Wow. And how old is Valentine now? Because I remember you talking about this person in the um, paper, it was I interesting. Think, um, I think maybe early 20s, I think early 20s. Okay. Is this the same person who their parents were very distressed by the gender nonconformity in childhood and so t took them to the... Yes, I think the mm. teacher was very... So thought this, the teacher. This abnormally interested in, in dolls, you know, very mm -hmm. abnormally interested in dolls. Um, you know, so you could think, is that a medical, is that a medical, <laughs> is that a medical problem? I mean, it makes it, obviously makes the, the, this boy unusual, um, but it doesn't necessarily make, there's not a medical health problem there. Yeah. It's really remarkable, too, that there's so much focus on the aesthetic, which is you describe as a cosmetic concern. But there's a lot of shaky evidence and lack of evidence about things that are arguably far more important, like cognitive development, IQ. Can you talk a little bit about what you discovered there? Yes. Yeah, so the the um, the the Dutch didn't really pay much attention to, to they so they looked at psychological sort of subject of subject psychological well-being and gender dysphoria uh, but although as you pointed out in your uh, interview with 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 Stainsma uh, and De Vries that they actually they they flipped the gender dysphoria scale so we can't actually be very very clear about mm -hmm. what happened it's gender dysphoria mm -hmm. but they didn't look at cogn cognition and so there are concerns I mean you know it, it it's Obviously, puberty is necessary for intellectual development. Obviously, it's sexual development as well, but also intellectual development, cognitive, emotional development. And so by freezing a child for three, four years when they should be developing mentally, uh, what effects does that have? Uh, we know that there is some worrying data from when you use puberty, the same drugs to for precocious puberty, um, that that has an effect on, mm -hmm. on IQ. Um, and so there is actually a, another sort of also a critical literature about the use of, of these drugs for precocious puberty. Um, and there's also animal experiments that show just that just came out recently uh, from mice uh, showing that actually it makes mice more ang ang puberty, puberty blockers, you know, suppressing puberty in mice makes them more anxious, more stressed out, um, more uh, prone, uh, sort of, you know, more aggressive, the males become more aggressive. So there are lots of, there's sort of actually good experimental evidence that there are some negative uh, consequences here. Now, you know, now, of course, you could say, well, we don't really know that whether that applies to kids. But the, but the point I would say is that it was the, it was the job of the people proposing the drug to do that investigation. And what I found, one of the things that I found which shocked me is that one, so the Peggy Cohen Kittenis is the main pro protagonist, and she's a psychiatrist. But there's also, um, and the endocrinologist is called uh, Henrietta uh, Delamar Vandervaal, Vandervaal Delamar, mm -hmm. Delamar Vandervaal. Mm -hmm. 
And she actually had a laboratory full of rats. So she had, and she worked on precocious puberty. That's why she got the idea of using pub, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists, what we call puberty blockers. She actually had rats in her laboratory, so she could have easily tested, done the done some randomized control trials on rats just to see what's the effect of puberty suppression. But she chose not to. Instead, she chose the the young girl who we know if, who is FG, who became their first kind of guinea pig in, in case study. Wow. Did you say in precocious puberty it, it, it doesn't have a I thought I thought it was pretty all right for precocious puberty. I think there are some concerning no there are there is well there is there is some data that is that is concerning about precocious puberty. I mean oh, in some ways IQ it, right the IQ drop yeah, is that right? Yeah. Yeah so I, it's not something I've looked in um okay. in huge detail um but because of course just to explain to the audience I mean the gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists are not licensed anywhere in the world mm. for treatment treating genitus dysphoria. So this is a completely off-label use. However, they are licensed for treating precocious puberty. But there is a kind of a, a, a critical literature on precocious puberty, which suggests that maybe too many uh, girls in particular are put on unnecessarily because the age of puberty is coming down um, yeah, I know. As, as we go on. And in, in America, Af African-American girls, a lot of African-American girls would be counted as having precocious puberty. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a year or two before normal, but of course normal varies. So should we be giving um, drugs to, to, you know, particularly because the only, res the only benefit of the drugs for precocious puberty, puberty blockers for pre precocious puberty, is height. That's the mm -hmm. rationale is to stop the kid getting becoming too short, because if you go through puberty too early, you you sort of your height, um, your growth phase ends too early, and so you end up shorter than you might be. But again, is that is that really a medical compelling medical issue? And I think with you know, sorry, you don't want to get into precocious puberty, but there's there's a difference between the first or so the first scientific report on this drug being used for precocious puberty it was literally like a three month old girl baby who started kind of pseudo menstruating oh, and developing. Wow. So obviously that's okay. something wrong there and we should stop that. But then if you say, well, this is a nine-year-old a nine nine year old girl yeah. going through puberty, mm. oh, we need to give her drugs to block that because actually it's a few years. But, well, maybe maybe that I think that's where it's questionable. Um, but I think that that's something that I've just sort of dabbled in. But I think even for precocious puberty, there are more sort of questions about that, that that need to be asked. So you can't just assume, oh, it's wonderful in precocious puberty, therefore we should use it for gender dysphoria as well. Well, well, this is something that I wanted to ask you more about because this this approach to puberty has a lot of serious implications about how we think of this kind of developmental stage. And you talk in your paper about how, you know, this potentially invites us to think about puberty as a kind of disease or as the hormones of the body as some sort of a medical issue. And it's like some people are using that to make the claim that it's uh, unethical for an individual to go through puberty if they didn't fully consent to the puberty. And I know that seems like a very fringe idea, but you highlight it like a case of a non-binary kid who kind of used this justification to be put on. It was something like over 10 years of puberty blockers so that they can remain androgynous in their appearance. And I think, you know, fringe cases like that really do raise some interesting questions about what are the implications of this approach, like how we're mm -hmm. thinking about puberty. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so in some ways it is a perversion, right? To think about the sort of body's natural processes, the, the essential process of becoming a, a, an adult human being as yeah. itself a kind of, you know, it's, it's almost like a kind of, it's, it's viewed as a kind of cancer, right? Mm -hmm. The cancer eating away at you. And mm -hmm. the sort of, particularly once kids have been, be between, have been socially transitioned, and of course, socially transitioning is only created by puberty blockers, right? The existence of puberty blockers allows early social transition. So for the first time, parents could say, I'm going to enroll my boy in primary school as a girl. And of course, you know, because I know that when puberty hits, we can stop it. And then, of course, the child is now absolutely terrified as soon as they begin to get a bit of hair, or, you know, the, the normal male puberty uh, signs of male puberty, it, the, this is now absolutely, it is catastrophic for the child because you, A, you've told the child for years and years, years, you're really a girl. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're, you know, you're maybe in stealth, maybe the other, all the other kids think, think mm -hmm. you're really a girl. And so it is, it is, it's sort of a, an induced, uh, induced by the transitioning process, 
catastrophic outcome. But the logic, yes, you're right, saying the logic is, well, you can't, you know, consenting to puberty is a bit like consenting to sex, you know, like, right. you know, there has to be sort of proactive <laughs> assent, enthusiastic, what are the, what's the, the term? Oh, yeah, sort of freely enth- given. <laughs> enthusiastic sort of explicit consent. And, of course, that wasn't intended by the Dutch because the mm. Dutch are very, at the very beginning, I mean, for, until recent, I mean, recently, and you saw that with your interview with, with, with Stainsma, and to freeze, they've sort of jumped on the non-binary queer stuff, but they were very, they were very straight-laced, they're very incredibly heteronormative. There's nothing more yeah. heteronormative than a, than a Dutch clinician. They're very much, here's a boy, we turn him into a straight girl. Here's a, okay. les- you know, a homosexual girl, we turn her into a he- good heterosexual uh, guy. And that was their very much their their fixed idea of you just you just basically transitioning one to the other, keeping the sex as distinct. Um, so actually, a very very sort of old fashioned approach to, to transsexuals. And, um, but of course, the, the implication is that puberty, why go through puberty at all? And there, there are some Australian cases now where, the, where you put the kid on puberty blockers at the age of 12 um, or 11 or where, whatever it is. And then when you come to 16, you say, okay, say, you know, now we're going to give you, she's a female, now we're going to give you testosterone. She says, no, I don't want, don't want the testosterone. I want to be a, a I, I want to be a, you know, sort of a juvenile forever. Oh. And even though this is catastrophic physically in terms of bone density and so on, she's now got the age of 16 where you can't, now she's, you know, if she was younger, you could say, well, we're going to force you to, to do this for your own good. But at 16, you say, well, she's got her own, she's, you know, she's an autonomous individual now. She can make her own decision. And it's her decision to be a non-binary person who never, who sort of- a, Literally never, never grows up. Puberty. And that's the logical consequence. And you could mm-hmm. say, well, of course, this is an anomaly. There's only a few cases like this. But of course, it was also true in the 1990s. This was also just an exceptional few cases. That really blew my mind when I read that because, you know, Stella and I and you, Michael, we all swim in this world. So it's mm-hmm. almost become, we're almost desensitized to it. But when I was thinking about how incredibly rare childhood transition interests were in the first place and then i read this thing about the like perpetually suspended in some kind of asexual state this little kid was i was like oh that's terrifying if this is where things are going because i'm sure nobody imagined 30 years ago that we would have this number of children transitioning so it's not impossible for that to be the way things are headed exactly exactly and i think that raises an important point which i think is also uh, really important to underline, and I think this is something that I really is important in my sort of thinking about things because I'm a quantitative sociologist. I think about numbers and I think about mm. rates and, and proportions. Mm. And if you start out, you know, you start out by you having the Dutch Gender Clinic, which is the first started by uh, Peggy Cohen Kittenis, which is the first gender clinic in Europe for for kids. And they had like an, on average of in the beginning they had nine nine kids a year. Um, and of course, they were transitioning when they started puberty blockers. It was very, very few, basically one a year, two a year. And now, of course, it's hundreds a year. And yeah. so you, you increase by two orders of magnitude. So you go from you know one to ten to a hundred and more. So that's a massive increase, and it's just implausible. I mean, you could make an argument. Look, there are some kids who are so dysphoric. You know, maybe one a year in the Netherlands, so dysphoric. We can we can guarantee they're going to be a transsexual. You know, we can let, tell them at age 12, you're going to be a transsexual. Let's start the process now. Okay, maybe that's an argument we could sort of entertain. Mm-hmm. But it's not plausible to say you just increase that, mm-hmm. double it, triple it, quadruple it, incre- t- tenfold, a hundredfold. And now we have all these hundreds of children who are also so terrible. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like that, yeah. to me, quantitatively, that that makes no sense. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and the Dutch never said... Oh wait, hold on a second. Yeah, you know, the thing that we thought was very, very, very rare is becoming more and more common. And as we, and the other thing, of course, is that you have the idea is this is a diagnostic tool. You put the you get the idea first is like you give the kid puberty blockers, and we'll see whether they really want to transition or not. If they don't, they can come off them and it'll be fine. Which of course is is, is incorrect, but that was the, the that was the selling point. Yeah. And then you find ninety eight percent of the kids going continuing to, to transition to, to cross-sex hormones. And that now, if you as you gave the puberty blockers to more and more kids, that, that figure should come down because you start out with the most extreme genes mm-hmm. for 95, and then you give it to less dysphoric kids, so some of them, but no, it, it sticks at 96, 90, oh, 97, 98%. 
And the Dutch never said, hold on a second, we're giving it to more and more kids. And all, all the kids we give it to, the diagnostic test is always coming out with the same result. They're tr really trans, they need to transition. And they never, you know, I mean, these are people who are supposedly, you know, sort of serious scientists. They've published a lot of articles. They've got professorships. And yet they, this sort of basic, basic kind of thing that really a kind of a, a smart undergraduate should be, should be raising, you know, if, if they read the literature, should, it was just completely passed them by. What's funny, it's not funny. What's shocking about that is I remember even taking like research methods courses in, in graduate school and even a questionnaire about a self-report kind of survey can influence the individual taking the exam. Or if you ask somebody, for example, to track for a week, like what thoughts they're having, that intervention in and of itself mm. is, is known to have an impact, which those are not biological interventions. So it's really remarkable to think you can biologically interfere with someone's development and call that a diagnostic tool, which clearly is going to impact the way things go. And uh, sorry, Stella, I know you probably have questions, but this question is really important because sure. it ties into <laughs> this. The, the early intervention had a profound impact on whether or not future surgeries would be as successful for these young people. And I know Marcy Bowers, who's a very well-known surgeon who's done thousands and thousands of vaginoplasties, has talked about this. But you clarified something in your work that Stella, well, I didn't know. I didn't know. I remember when we reported on the puberty blockers and the follow-up with cross-sex hormones and surgery, we knew that one of the male-to-female participants died of what was described as necrotizing fasciitis, which is an infection. But actually, what you clarified is it's most likely because that child had been blocked in puberty and he didn't have enough penile tissue that when it came time to do the vaginoplasty, they had to use tissue from the colon and that's a much riskier procedure. And actually that's likely why this person died. This feels incredibly crucial to me because it means it's not the same complication rate as an adult transitioning. It's actually worse because the puberty was blocked. So yeah. Can you just flush that out for anybody who needs to hear it? <laughs> yes, yes. So one of the, and again, if you look back in the history, that one of the puzzling things is is that they don't, they even though sort of activists around um, in the early 2000s were already raising this issue, this problem is that it seems, you know, for a female, it's it seems very, un it is more uncomplicated, right? Puberty suppression makes subsequent transition with cross-sex hormones much easier, you know, yeah. cosmetic. Absolutely. But for males, there's a major disadvantage, and that is you don't have enough penis. Your penis doesn't mm. grow as with the penis of a small boy, and therefore you don't have enough to create the vaginoplasty. So actually, even for even if you're thinking of becoming a transsexual, there's a major doubt. There's an upside is you're mm. going to look less masculine, you're going to, your face might be better, have less hair and all the rest, but your genitals, the genital surgery will actually be much worse. So instead of using the penile tissue, as you said, they will have to use some of your colon. Now, of course, that means opening up your intestines, and that's actually much, much, much riskier because then you have a different site. And of course, intestines are also, you know, messy. Um, Is that what and they so do that with Jazz much... Jennings? Yes, exactly. That's yeah. what happens oh, with Jazz oh. Jennings. Yeah. yeah. So most most early puberty males who are subject to early puberty suppression do have to have the vaginoplasty. Uh, this this much work riskier surgery, vaginoplasty mm. surgery, but also it's, it's less, less, you know, there's some, you know, it's sort of less likely to provide pleasure to you and so on and so forth. So it's actually bad in other ways as well. So what the Dutch, uh, De Vries et al., what they report in this landmark article, they say, you know, unfortunately, out of the 70, one of the, the kids died through, you know, through this necrotizing fasciitis. What they don't say is that, well, the reason why they died of necrotizing fasciitis is because they were puberty blocked and therefore they had, there was, there was some, I think, E. coli possibly in, in the intestine that when it was transplanted. Oh. And that's why they, they actually died in the hospital. Uh, so it wasn't just a, like a random hospital infection. It was actually due, you know, indirectly to the consequences of puberty suppression, which and I, when I was re reading over again, just in preparation for mm. our, our talk, I realized the, the medical article on the surgery came out in 2017. Whereas, of course, the article comes from 2014. So it's three years. So he must have, the kid must have been killed in 
2014 or 2013 or you know before that. But the article, the, the article that came out in the Surgery Journal only comes out in 2017. So it was an interesting sort of time lag. Um, so they took a while to publish publish that. So yeah, whether that's maybe there was had more research to do and it just got on the bottom of the pile. But I think and that was not sort of that's not sort of part of the gender medicine. That's the sort of surgery surgery journal uh, journals for for people who are just doing you know urologists and so on who are doing uh, these kind of genital surgeries. It's it's phenomenal that this has happened. What is your overall kind of analysis of the almost infamous Dutch protocol at this stage? Because you, you do seem to be a leading researcher on what actually has happened. What is mm. the, the credibility of this study? So I think, yeah, so I think sort of to summarise, I suppose, the, the intellectual foundations were much shakier. So that massive gap where they say, um, the silence around the homosexuality. They start off by admitting that most kids with gender dysphoria become, become homosexual, and then they just suddenly miss that off and forget about that. So the sort of it wasn't particularly well grounded in, in the in the literature on gender dysphoria as it was back in the in those in those days. It clearly hasn't been adjusted. They haven't updated. You know, again, maybe there's a, an argument to be made that you know, very very rare cases of extreme gender dysphoria, we can identify the kid as transsexual. You know, I think that's actually very questionable, but let's say, let's entertain that as a hypothesis. They haven't updated that to this mass, hundreds and hundreds of kids a year uh, going through uh, mm -hmm. this process. Um, the other thing is that the empirical evidence was always much more, you know, it was much, there was much less of the empirical evidence. Uh, in fact, that's what we haven't, I don't think we've mentioned this yet, but uh, one of the things that you, when you read the article carefully, a lot of the results, the, the good results just come they didn't ask the. They didn't give the questionnaires to all the kids, or the kids didn't fill out the questionnaires. So sometimes it, some of the results mm. might be based on thirty-two kids, or you know. So so it's not even the seventy goes down to fifty-five, but actually they've got data on maybe thirty-two kids, which is you know a relatively small number to base a kind of a massive uh, medical uh, <gasps> procedure on. All over and the so world. I think they get them, and the, and the fact yeah. that they killed one of the 70 of the kids they actually killed, I mean, that's that's a big deal. And would, would as I said in the paper, would, would close down any any other any other process, any other treatment that you had that kind of fatality rate among healthy kids. I mean, these are not kids with leukemia who are cancer or something. These are kids who are healthy Dutch teenagers. Mm. Uh, and they, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. one in 70 mm -hmm. of them. So I think the, the and and the final thing I think needs to be um, emphasized here, particularly for Americans or who think, oh, you know, gender medicine in America is like cowboys, these private providers, they're making money off it. It's very sloppy, but the Dutch are very, very rigorous, at least in the, pr in the procedure, in the process. But actually they're much less rigorous than, than, than you might think. I mean, let me give you, a, I think a very striking example is that it was a British film. A British film crew took a, a, a young girl, a 13 year old girl who identified as a boy, um, to the Netherlands to see the latest results. So that obviously things were in train before the first articles were published in 1996, because so, this is the same year. And uh, they meet uh, this third uh, character in the, in, the, in the Dutch triumvirate called uh, an endocrinologist called Louis Horen. And he, they sit down for, a, for an interview um, in, the, in Amsterdam. Then this kid, Fred, comes back to the Tavistock Clinic. And the Tavistock, he's, Fred is told in the Tavistock Clinic, we're not going to give you puberty blockers, sorry. You know, you might have seen them in, in the Netherlands, but we're not doing this until you're 16. And then the mother, this is all on, captured by the documentary crew, the mother rings up uh, Horan and says, oh, what can I do? And, and Horan says, I'll write you out a prescription for triptorillin for three months. So Horan is in a different country. He's met uh, the kid for like half an hour, an hour filming the documentary. The, the child's clinician has said, we're not going to go ahead with this. And Horan says, oh, yeah, sure. Why not? Um, and so that that gives you a, an understanding of just how kind of rigorous the Dutch clinicians are. And as he says, you know, if I, I wouldn't, you know, if I knew that the kid was transsexual, I wouldn't want them to go through puberty. So, you know, mm. all right. And, and there's other many, many other little kind of anecdotes like that. So one of the, the other things they'll say, they'll say in the, in the sort of published Dutch protocols, the family have to be supportive. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. Otherwise, we won't do it. But in actual fact, in a, if you read a sort of an esoteric kind of book chapter published by Peggy Cohen-Kettinus, she says, oh, there was, a, there was a kid who was, I think, from Muslim parents, 
and they were confined and institutionalized because they're physically handicapped and um, they're 14 year old, I think they were 14. We wanted to give them puberty blockers. The parents wouldn't agree, so we went to the court and got a court order. So, you know, again, you know, they're, they're accept the Dutch are making exceptions all the, all the time. Um, so I think, you know, the Dutch, even the Dutch, I mean, the Dutch, may, it may well be that the Dutch are better than, than the Americans, um, but I think that even the Dutch are not much, far less rigorous than it appears in the sort of the Dutch protocol in the, in the, yeah. in the black and white. And we heard this when we spoke to Teresios, who's a young man who exactly. transitioned, who was treated as a child Absolutely. by the Dutch. What was the name of that documentary you mentioned? We'd like to put it in the notes for it, anyone who wants to see it. It was called The Wrong Body. Mm, uh, okay. It was called The Wrong Body. Okay. Um, and so there's an archive copy at the, I had to track it down because it's hard to find, but it's at the, there's an archive copy at the British Film Institute. Okay, uh, I'll, also I'll add that. Yeah, and it was actually had a big, uh, had a very large audience, I think 3 million in the UK. So it's a big, big documentary. And the the sort of the, the most important transgender activist group in Britain called Gendered Intelligence. Oh, yeah. Mm. That was founded by Jay Stewart. Yeah. And Jay Stewart says, when watching this documentary, that's when I first thought, you know, Jay Stewart was then had, was at that time a lesbian, said, ah, I, I'm actually a trans man. So it was it was quite important for Jay Stewart's sort of development Wow! as well. So it actually had a, quite a big impact, this documentary. Yeah. Well, Michael, I mean, it was really uh, an education to have you on. I feel like people who heard our interview with the Dutch and have heard our interview with Teresios really were hungry for more information. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you came on and shared your vast knowledge and your in-depth analysis with us because it's it's really important to understand no thanks yes no i think it's important i was going to say it's, it's a pleasure but it's not really a pleasure because what we're talking about <laughs> is um you know very very difficult um yeah. things and um but i hope that the information i think people should know more about yeah. the actual um and also the physical details i think it's really important you know when you're talking about vaginoplasties to actually be very mm. graphic mm -hmm. about the the results of what happens if you put somebody's proportion of somebody's intestine you know, in a sort of a, a hole that you've created between their, between their legs. And I mean, that, that's very, because I think that one of the things about gender, which is also the gender medicine, which I don't like, um, and which I think is, is, is the sort of the obscure language. Yeah. I think they don't, there was a gender affirming care. Do you support gender affirming care? Not do you support taking a piece of the, this boy's intestine and putting it, using it as a, to, to line um, a new orifice that were created. I mean, like that, yeah. that, that changes the view and gender, yeah, gender confirmation surgery. So I think, you know, trying to be as explicit, I mean, not, not trying to be, you know, overly yeah. graphic, but mm -hmm. it's very mm -hmm. important to be very straightforward about what the effects are on the body of these yeah. procedures, um, yeah. rather than using this kind of very fluffy or top surgery, you know, mm -hmm. this list mm -hmm. actually use the explicit proper language. Yeah, I agree that it provides clarity and it's a more honest way for patients who are considering these mm, surgeries exactly. or parents exactly. who are considering these interventions can have that that clarity. So that's very helpful. And, and, we'll and, include yeah, it's a fundamental aspect of informed consent, clear, yeah. understandable language that hasn't got kind of obscure, oblique other sorts of understandings. Yeah, mm, exactly. Yes. Uh, Michael, we'll link your papers in the show notes. Um, if there's anything else you would like us to include for our audience, I'm sure they'd be curious to read more. You can send it our way. And um, we're really grateful. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thanks very much. I enjoyed I enjoyed the conversation. Pa thanks, Michael. And I, I look forward to you putting your eagle eye on every country. <laughs> yes. <Keep coming. laughs> yes. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.